Oh, man, shake. I'm really tired. Well, did you get enough sleep last night? Oh, I don't know. I didn't go to bed until 2 a.m. Wow. Well, sleep is necessary to maintain your body's health. And it's something that overwhelmed teenagers definitely don't get enough of. I know. I sure don't. But is getting enough sleep really that important? Well, in this presentation, we're going to be learning about some pretty surprising things about sleep. For example, if you're not getting enough of it, you're at a 50% higher risk for obesity. When we modeled a real world situation, it's true. Sleep is important. Hi, I'm Shaker. And I'm Sukish. And this is Medicine, Medicine Made, made simple. simple. As you can see today, we will discuss the benefits of adequate sleep. As we were coming back from a hiatus, we made this extra special video that's two parts. First, we're going to be discussing the fun stuff behind sleep before finally moving on to discussing the science behind it. As always, each segment will have timestamps both on the screen and in the description below so you can watch each individual section or the whole video. So, like we said, we're gonna be going over the fun stuff about sleep first, including what happens when we actually sleep, factors that influence our sleep, effects of both proper and poor rest, how much sleep you actually need, and then we're going to delve a little bit into dreams and then look at the always fun, fun facts about sleep before finally looking at steps to achieve better rest. So really, what happens when we sleep? All of our bodily functions slow down, specifically our body temperature, it drops, then our brain activity decreases, the heart and breathing rate slow down, and there is a temporary paralysis of the muscles. However, during one of the stages of sleep, known as rapid eye movement or REM sleep, all of our bodily functions rapidly increase. Here are some factors that actually influence sleep. Now, you might have a lot of people try and tell you that watching TV or drinking helps them fall asleep, but as we'll see later, that's not actually true. Things like the amount of light level in your room, how much stress or anxiety you're feeling can affect your sleep, along with if you smoke, intake caffeine, have pain medication, or you're drinking large amounts of alcohol. As you can see, this puppy looks as if it is getting some quality sleep. If we do the same, we can reap the benefits, which includes increased concentration in the work or the classroom setting, increased productivity, a boosted athletic performance for our teen athletes out there, and a boosted immune system. We also interact with people better when we have enough sleep every day. On the opposite side of that coin, while sleep does give us several advantages, there are several disadvantages to not getting enough. For example, if you don't get an adequate amount of sleep, it's actually linked to having a higher risk of heart attacks, strokes, depression, weight gain, and as we mentioned at the beginning of this video, obesity. In this next slide, we can see that Johns Hopkins Medicines claims that there is a 50% higher risk of an obesity diagnosis if we receive less than five hours of sleep each night. So clearly it's important to be getting your sleep in. Johns Hopkins Medicines also claims that inadequate sleep has also caused approximately 6,000 fatal car crashes, a 33% increase in dementia, a three to five year sleep deprivation period for our brain, a 36% increase in colorectal cancer, and a 48% increase in developing heart disease. You're also three times more likely to develop a cold. So we've talked a little bit about why sleep is important, but now it's good to know how much you really need. So for infants aged four months to 12 months old, the recommended amount of sleep is 12 to 16 hours, including naps, according to the Mayo Clinic. And for us preteens and teens who are aged between 13 and 18 years old, the Mayo Clinic recommends anywhere between eight and 10 hours of sleep. So going to bed at 2 a.m. really doesn't make sense if we have to get up for school at about six or seven. And then finally, if you're an adult, you actually need seven or more hours. So even as we grow older, it's still important to get that sleep numbers in. So now we all know that dreams are stories in our brain while we sleep. 
Dreams occur during the last stage of sleep, known as the rapid eye movement stage or the REM stage. Now, scientists still don't understand why we dream, but there are several theories that exist around the thought of dreaming. And here's an interesting quote from tr- the great transcendentalist and romantic essayist Henry David Thoreau. He once said, our truest life is when we are in dreams awake. It's a really interesting quote because we all dream and we have these sensations. And as we mentioned, there are theories behind them, which we'll get to when we delve into the science later on in this presentation. But it's all about how we relate it to things we want to happen. So go out there and make your dreams come true. Now let's look at some fun facts about sleeping. Humans spend about one third of their entire lives sleeping. So it does make sense that we should try to get all of the one third as it's very important to our everyday bodily function and it makes up a big portion of our lives. Not only that, but being awake for 16 hours straight decreases your performance as much as if your blood alcohol level were 0.05% when the legal limit is actually 0.08%. So sleepy driving is really the same as drunk driving. So there is a myth that exercising right before bed is good for us and it actually makes us sleepy. But the truth is that regular exercise improves sleep but exercising right before bed does the opposite. So we should try to get regular exercise sometime throughout the day or early in the morning. Another common myth that people hold is that your body is just entirely inactive while sleeping. You're basically just a lump laying on the couch, although that's what my parents call me. But this is actually not true because during certain stages, your body function actually jumps to normal awake levels. As we mentioned with REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, your body while sleeping has the same vital signs as if you were awake, which is pretty crazy to think about. Now, there are several theories coming out and research that shows that looking at electronic devices does not help us fall asleep. And it is Once again, true, looking at our phones, the TV, or even drinking alcohol, it actually disrupts sleep rhythms. So if we use any of these devices before bed or drink, we should do it in moderation. And finally, here's a really interesting one. Falling asleep in class doesn't actually mean that you're lazy. Puberty in teenagers actually disrupts your sleep cycle or circadian rhythm, meaning that teens end up sleeping later and rising later than most adults do. So that's why many schools across the nation have been changing their start times to later in the morning, say 8 or even 8.30 in the morning. But try explaining that to your teacher when they get mad at you for falling asleep in class. So after we look at the fun facts, let's look at some steps we can all take to achieve better rest. Now, as we mentioned in the fun facts, put the electronics down before sleeping. On top of that, you can balance your time and set aside around eight to nine hours to sleep. Kind of like when you budget money, in this case, you're budgeting sleep time. And going off the budgeting, we can also establish a regular bedtime as when we establish a normal routine. A healthy diet and exercise is linked to getting better sleep, especially because these things are really interrelated. If you don't get enough sleep, you have higher health risks. But if you decrease your health risks, you can actually try and sleep better. And if you'd like to try to get better rest during the night, try to avoid the afternoon naps that we all enjoy. In fact, we most, most of us get groggy around 1 to 3 p.m. So a 15 minute power nap might do the trick, but don't take one or two hour long naps. Another thing you can do is avoiding caffeine, especially early in the day, which might be kind of hard for some people because we all know we need our morning coffee. But if you stay away from caffeine or other weird additives, you can actually achieve better rest. And finally, put aside the stressful thoughts and take some time to breathe and meditate. It could be going three seconds in, waiting for three seconds and letting air out for three seconds. And that's a great, simple way to meditate and breathe. If you still can't fall asleep after 30 minutes, get out of bed. Do something like stretch or fold the laundry, read, or do something tedious. And once again, stay away from the screens. Finally, now that we've talked about the fun stuff, let's learn about the science behind sleep and why it does what it does. In this presentation, we're going to be looking at the stages of sleep, We're going to be talking about different parts like non-REM and REM sleep, 
not only looking at the brain waves a little bit of how your brain works during different stages of sleep, we'll be taking a look at your circadian rhythm, some sleep statistics, the theories on dreaming, and why sleep is important to our bodies. So as we can see here, we have the stages of sleep and there are five stages. On the image to the left, we're missing a stage known as the N4 stage, but the important aspect is that the N1, N2, and N3 stages make up the non-REM sleep stages, and then obviously there's the REM sleep stage. The N1 is known as the lightest sleep stage, the N2 is known as a light sleep stage, and then the N3 is known as the deep sleep stage. In the non-REM1 stage of sleep, there's drowsiness and the humans are drifting towards sleep. In the non-REM2 stage, there's a light sleep and there's a decrease in the brain activity. In non-REM3 stage, we have the moderate sleep. And then in non-REM4, we have the deep sleep or the slow waves, which we didn't discuss in the previous slide, but there's slow brain waves that Shaker will discuss in the next parts of the video. And finally, we have the rapid eye movements sleep. And this is when our vitals mimic an awake state. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between non-REM sleep and REM sleep. As you know, REM stands for rapid eye movement. And that's because when you're asleep and your eyes are closed, your eyes are actually darting back and forth really quickly. That's why it's called rapid eye movement. As you can see with this picture on the right, you see that beneath the eyelids, the person's eyes are moving around very quickly, which is why it's called rapid eye movement or REM or REM sleep. Now, the other stages are called non-REM sleep because quite frankly, this doesn't happen. But as you can see, we spend most of our time in non-REM sleep stage two, which is basically that somewhat moderate or light stage of sleep, but it's a little bit more deep than just being drowsy and it's stage one. So we spend about 60% of our time in non-REM stage two and about 23% of our time in REM sleep, which as you'll remember from earlier, REM sleep is where the dreams occur. In order for our brain to actually fully process the memories of the day, it needs to go through REM sleep. Now, on this next slide, you can see a picture of brain waves that we experience during each stage of sleep. And you'll see on the next slide that we actually have an enlarged version of the graph on the right. The graph on the left is taken from a real EEG. But if we see on this next slide that the very first stage of us being awake is when we have somewhat rapid brain activity. But when we move to stage one, we experience what we call alpha waves, which is when it's mainly a flat line, but we have occasional spikes up and down. Then when we move to stage two of non-REM sleep, we see these things called beta waves, where we have sleep spindles and K complexes. This is just a fancy term for we have basically clumps of brain waves all together where there's huge spikes in activity. As you can see from this picture, you see that most of it's flat with a little bit of activity, and then you have this K complex and sleep spindle, also known as a theta wave, which is a huge cluster of brain activity. Then finally, as we progress to stages three and four of non-REM sleep, really close to REM sleep, we experience slow waves or delta waves, where you see that we have progressively larger uh, periods of brain activity. As you can see, this is the one that has the largest amplitude for the brain waves. We see that they progressively get larger, which is why they're called slow waves, because the larger they are in amplitude, the slower that they're moving across the EEG, which is the thing that's measuring the brain waves. And finally, when you go to REM sleep, you see that there are small parts of brain activity, but our vital signs are actually mimicking what it was like when we were awake. So even though they're not as clustered, as dense as the brain waves from when we're awake, REM sleep still has us match those vital signs. So we're not actually inactive while sleeping. That's when our brain is processing all the memories of the day and actually helping to restore our body. So now let's talk a little bit about our circadian rhythm. It's literally all in our head. Now the human brain works like a clock. Our brain is responsible for the circadian rhythm, which are the internal controls that allow our body to know when to sleep, regardless of the environment. In fact, there was an experiment done in the 1960s where the subjects were entered on an underground bunker with no access to the sunlight, clocks, or any time-telling devices. They found that the brain follows a 25-hour sleep cycle, which tells our body when to sleep. A fun fact is that the longest a person has gone without sleeping is 11 days. So 
clearly what we can see is that with that experiment, even if humans have no access to light or clocks or anything, our body naturally knows when to go to sleep, but it doesn't follow the 24 hour cycle that we do on earth. Instead, it's closer to around 25 hours. But some food for thought here is that the cycle on Mars for a day actually lasts around 24 hours and 37 minutes, which is more close to our circadian rhythms than Earth's day, which is 23 hours and 56 minutes. So who knows, maybe we were destined to be programmed internally for Mars. Now we can look at the scientific theories on dreaming. The first theory is the memory processing theory. This theory states that dreaming makes the neurocortex fire, which triggers our hippocampus into uploading information so that the next day it has a fresh start. A second theory that we have is oxygen, and that rapid eye movement, or REM, stimulates oxygen to be provided to the cornea, allowing your eyes to function. This way your eyes don't suffocate when you're sleeping. And finally, the third theory on dreaming is called the desire and threat theory. We dream because we experience things that we want fulfilled. Another theory is that we dream to protect against the threats, similar to a fire drill that we, do, we, we would do in our school. There are multiple different kinds of dreams, some of which we might have heard of. The first is recurring dreams, which are ones that repeat more than once, where every time we go to bed, we get something with the same theme. They can be neutral or they can actually be recurring nightmares. The second kind of dream that we all know and have heard of is called daydreaming. These occur consciously while a person is zoned out. And the daydreams usually involve other people in this person's life during the daydream. And a fun fact to know here is that if you daydream about people you know, that shows that you're in a good well-being or a good mental state. A third type of dream is called a lucid dream. It's basically a type where you're aware that you're dreaming, which sounds pretty crazy, but we've all had them before. 55% of people have at least one in their life, and some people can actually control their dreams, which is pretty crazy to think about. And finally, the most scariest kind of dream is the nightmares. And they're literally the scary and the disturbing dreams. 71% of the patients who have suffered post-traumatic stress disorder experience nightmares. Some of the common themes among the nightmares include death, violence, and being chased. So now that we've taken a look at dreams and all these theories, what exactly does sleep do to our bodies? Because we've been reiterating that sleep helps us do this, sleep helps us do that, it helps us to function, but what exactly does it do? And we can answer this question through a research study that involved the National Institute of Health and the University of Rochester Medical Center and mice. According to a study funded by the National Institute of Health, Dr. Mikan Nettergaard at the University of Rochester Medical Center found that the space between the brain cells may increase during sleep, allowing the brain to flush out any of the toxins during the daytime. The scientists arrived at this statement as they injected dye into the cerebrospinal fluid of several mice and found that the dye flowed rapidly when the mice were unconscious and flowed slowly when the mice were conscious. So it is no doubt that we need sleep as it literally clears up our brains. As always, here are the sources for the images that we use in this presentation. And on the next slide, you'll see the sources for the information that we used in the order that it was cited. So feel free to click on any of these links to either check us or just learn a little bit more about sleep. If you have any further questions about sleep or want to contact us with any further video ideas, you can contact us on these Instagram accounts below. Also, make sure that you drop a comment about what you liked and give us some future video ideas about what you would like to learn about. Once again, I'm Shaker. And I'm Sugish. And this is a reminder to live happy, live happy and, and healthy. healthy.